day. We got our frost. So that means winter is on the way, but it also means we got some sunshine. Clear skies and the forecast is looking nice. So I'm looking forward to a beautiful day. I can turn it up to my mouth a little. How's that? Okay. Let's start our singing with number 512, Just When I Need Him Most. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him, Jesus is true. Never forsaking all the way through. Giving for burdens, pleasures are new. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer Just when I need him most Just when I need him Jesus is strong Bearing my burdens all the day long For all my sorrow giving a song Just when I need him most Just when I need him most just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most, just when I need him, he is my all. Answering when upon him I call, tenderly watching lest I should fall. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need him most. Let's sing our next song. Let's sing number 373, Seeking the Lost. Jim, that'll be you and me on the men part. And Fred, if I can get Fred in the back there. 373 I love this song but it is so low it's hard to to uh, belt it out r strong enough yeah if you can raise it up that'd be good Seeking the lost, just kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the Master speaking today. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wanderer back again. Into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, the Lamb for sinners slain. Seeking the lost and pointing to Jesus, souls that are weak and hearts that are so, leading them forth in ways of salvation, pointing the path to life evermore. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wonder back again. 
to the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, the Lamb for sinners slain. Thus I would do on missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen, pointing the past to Jesus the Lord. Going out far upon the mountain, bringing the wonder back again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, the Lamb for sinners slain. Amen. For our next song, let's sing. Number 610, Stand Like the Brave, 610. Christian, awake, tis the Master's command, with helmet and shield and a sword in thy hand, to meet the bold tempter, go fearlessly go, then stand like the brave, with thy face to the foe. Stand like the brave, stand like the brave, stand like the brave, with thy face to the foe. The cause of thy master with vigor defend, be watchful, be zealous, and fight to the end. Wherever he leads thee, go valiantly, go. Then stand like the brave, with thy face to the foe. Stand like the brave, stand like the brave, stand like the brave, with thy face to the foe. Press on, never doubting, the captain is near, with grace to supply and with comfort to cheer. His love like a stream in the desert will flow, then stand like the brave, with thy face to the foe. Stand like the brave, stand like the brave, stand like the brave, with thy face to the foe. We started reading recently, re recently rereading together in the Pilgrim's Progress. And I'd encourage you to do that if you have family members to join with. It's kind of a fun thing to each take a part of the different characters in the story. But Pilgrim's Progress, next to the Bible, is one of the great classics of Christian faith. And as you sing through some of these songs, you see references to the Bible, but you also see references to Pilgrim's Progress. And I think that's one of the, the things that this song is talking about. Stand like the brave with thy face to the foe. In the story of uh, Pilgrim's Progress, Christian is faced by Apollyon, one of uh, the, the devil's uh, agents, trying to defeat him in the Valley of Humiliation. And so he's going through um, the, the devil basically telling him, you, uh, you left the service of myself, and I'm trying to get you back, and I'll treat you well if you come back. But uh, the devil's telling him, um, you don't deserve, you know, you, you have made a lot of mistakes along the way. You fell into the slew of despond. Uh, you followed uh, uh, legalism and, and went off up, up to the, the hill of uh, difficulty there, and you went off on all these side tangents, and you've made all these mistakes, so therefore God will never forgive you. And Christian says, I can't turn around and, and go, because if I go back, my backside will be unprotected, and he'll attack me from the rear. So I've got to stand and face the foe. And that's what the song is talking about. 
When the devil throws those darts of discouragement at us, we need to stand like the brave. Let's sing number 537, He Leadeth Me. Blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught, whether I do, wherever I be, still it is God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp my hand in thine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth thee me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold grave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. For our final song, let's turn to number 522. My hope is built on nothing less. 522. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, no other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, and blood support me in the running flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand.
found. Amen. It's time now for our lesson study, but before we do that, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the salvation that you've offered us in Christ Jesus. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be with us now as we open your word to study and draw us closer to you. Help us to be ready for your coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, and happy Sabbath to all. The title of this week's lesson is The Restless Prophet, <clears throat> which covers the amazing events in the book of Jonah. But before we start, let's say a little prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, help me make a very clear presentation today so that your listeners will understand the importance of the words of Jonah and of you that give him guidance and also serve as a role model for us to ourselves in our walk with you. And I ask for these things in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> The book of Jonah <coughs> is a historical narrative, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> with few prophetic messages or verses, but it has a very definite theological message. And what we will learn in our study is that the book of Jonah's main purpose is to teach us about God. And I didn't quite realize this until I really did more reading on this during the last couple of days. Through Jonah's experience, God, the all-powerful creator, as we all know, reveals that though he is a God who will pour out his wrath, we hear that in the Bible, we read that in the Bible, on the wicked, he is also one who eagerly pours out his mercy on those who repent, and that includes nations and us and he also would do including those that we would uh, too quickly deem beyond mercy and we all know what that means our own judgment against people sometimes works against us and of course it works against God's efforts yes. oh. Does that work? Your zipper. Okay. Oh, I need to put it somewhere. Yeah. There? Okay. Guess we're ready now. I'm going to look at a couple of things and give you a little background. Jonah was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. And of course you remember that the northern kingdom of Israel was composed of ten tribes. Uh, and this is during a, a politically charged period. And also, but it was a prosperous one. 
But as far as our reading and our understanding of what happened during this period of time, it was a very spiritually dark one. And this is during the reign of Jeroboam II. And this occurred between 793 and 753 BC when he was reigning from Samaria. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He refused to turn from the sins that his predecessor had led Israel to commit. And his reign produced great wealth, but was not accompanied by justice. In fact, Jeroboam II was known as the prosperous oppressor. What I didn't realize was during this period of time, the Jews did basically everything possible to aggrandize themselves at the expense of the poor and the common man. And this was a thing that God was very, very, very opposed to. But they did not turn away from this. During his reign, the northern kingdom reached its greatest extent in terms of its size and experienced its greatest prosperity since King Solomon. On a human level, looking at what was going on, an explanation for Israel's newfound prosperity was that Assyria, its neighbor, and also its enemy, experienced a decline in his power during this time, which allowed the northern kingdom to expand and to prosper. Sometime during the reign of King Jeroboam, around 755 BC, the prophet Jonah, and we know this, grudgingly traveled to Nineveh to proclaim judgment. And we can read that in Jonah 3, 4, during this decline in the serious power. And as we will find out, as Jonah had feared, the king and people of Nineveh listened and repented of their sins, and God granted them a reprieve. And this lasted for some 150 years. And the repentance here is in response to Jonah's preaching. But unfortunately, as we will read or as we study later on, the repentance evidently did not have a lasting root because they reverted to their practices again. And ultimately, as we'll read later, God decided that they needed to go. Nineveh. Now just go back here and give you a little bit more background. This exceedingly great city lay on the eastern or left bank of the Tigris River. And you all heard about the Tigris River because it goes through Iraq. Actually it starts in the Anatolia, or we call it today Turkey. And it stretched some 30 miles in terms of all of the villages and fields and all the other things that were involved here with the city. And uh, it was quite very, it was quite large. In fact, today when you go up there and look at this area, the ruins are very extensive, but they're just ruins because, as we'll know later, the city was totally razed to the ground, burned, destroyed, and just razed to the ground. Nineveh was strategically located in the center of the highway between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. And that united the west with the east. And that goes back well over 2,000 years. The great wealth flowed into uh, Nineveh from many, many, many sources because of its trade and its influence. And also because of the tributes paid by the empires which it had controlled, the kingdoms which it controlled. So that it became the greatest of all ancient cities, the capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire or Kingdom. The Assyrian Empire, again a neighbor here of Israel, ruled for more than 600 years with 
absolutely hideous tyranny and violence. And of course, when you look at the map, you have to look at the map from the standpoint of today. It rules from an area that comprised much of the Caucasus, the Caspian Sea, the Persian Gulf, and lands all the way from the Tigris to the Asia Minor and to Egypt itself. So it was a very large area that they controlled with great, in this case, tyranny and vengeance. Like I said before, it was raised to the ground in 612 BC by the Medes and the Babylonians, actually. And its utter destruction was prophesied by both Nahum, which you can read, it's the book which follows Noah, excuse me, Jonah, and Zephaniah. And its ruins today, in terms of a historical context, lay across the Tigris from the city of Mosul, which is a very large city in Iraq, northern Iraq, which is in what we call, or is now known as, Iraqi Kurdistan. And of course, Kurdistan happens to be also the home of the descendants of the Medes. Interesting historical uh, context here. I'm going to do a little summary here that gives you a kind of a breakdown, helps you in our lesson. A little bit different than what they give in the book, but I'm going to do a little bit different approach here because I think it's a little more clear. Here's a summary of the chapters. The book of Jonah falls into two, two parts. Very easy to see this. In chapters 1 and 2, as you read, Jonah initially rejects the Lord's commission, his call. Breaks, you know, doesn't do what, the God, what God asks. Instead of heading to Nineveh, Jonah sets out by a ship in the opposite direction. And you read that in Jonah 1.3. The Lord stops Jonah in his tracks with a raging storm and, of course, a great fish. Let us look at the next, the, the lesson itself here. And I'll start with looking at Jonah's disobedience, his discipline, and his deliverance. And what we need to do here is read chapters 1 and chapters 2. And I'll start by reading chapter 1. I believe I can do that here quite easily. And you with your Bibles can start Jonah on page 897 of your Bible. I think most of you have a Bible there in front of you, but you can read with me, along with me, starting on page 897. Yes, starting on the first chapter. Jonah, first chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. This is God talking to, to Jonah. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And Tarshish, as we probably have figured out by now, is a city on the far end of the Mediterranean toward the Straits of Gibraltar. It was in Spain. Some people say it's in Asia Minor, but a lot of the scholars today have kind of traced it to the Spanish or the Iberian Peninsula, in other words, to Spain, and very close to the so-called Rock of Gibraltar, the Straits of Gibraltar. He went down to Joppa, which is a city very close to Tel Aviv, today, the modern city of Tel Aviv. Yeah, Joppa, and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. 
But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and, there, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship, and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may come, that we may know for those for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? And of course he asked, What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? And Jonah, of course, answers this, he says. So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. But I know that this great tempest is because of me. He acknowledges that. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous around them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the man <clears throat> feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. There's some points here that I just make quickly. Jonah's attempt to get away from the Lord was, as we can see, futile. The important thing here is one cannot escape God or disobey his will without consequences, and we can certainly see it here. <clears throat> Jonah's reluctance to go to Nineveh is understandable, however, because Israel, <clears throat> uh, Assyria, was an enemy of Israel, and it was known for its violence. Jonah did not want <clears throat> the, uh, these uh, non-Israelites, these, in, this, in this case, idol worshippers, to have the opportunity to repent and be saved. And we'll see that in Jonah 4, 2. In 1, 4, Jonah 1, 4, God's power over nature is a prominent feature, a prominent theme throughout Jonah. And in 1, 9, it says, Jonah worshipped the Lord, who is, and who, in contrast to the sailors, false gods, made the sea in the Lord. And of course, there's a designation here. It says, God of heaven, which means basically that the God of heaven has superior, is superior to all of the gods, the false gods in this case, of the sailors and of, of those people. So there's, it's an interesting kind of a 
play here on talking about God and idols and and about heaven and all the others that go with it. And it says that the last part of us is throw me. Join us calmness in giving this direction to the sailors is very surprising. But he was willing to face death with calmness and rather to give hated, the hated Assyrians a chance to repent. That's an interesting point. He accepts the fact that he is responsible for jeopardizing the sailor's life. And he can he, he justifies this by thinking that if he does this, he won't have to deal with the Assyrians and the possibility that they're going to be repentant. Because he knows that God is going to do what? He's going to save them. He's going to give them reprieve. <coughs> An interesting point here on 116, Jonah 116, is that they were awestruck. The sailors were awestruck. God's display of power over the storm uh, uh, tossed sea moved the pagan sailors to worship. It's an interesting point. And it's really quite ironic that. In this situation, the pagan sailors honored God, the Lord, while Jonah, the Lord's prophet, did what? He dishonored him by his, by his actions. And, of course, he now, is now thrown into the sea, and, of course, apparently he's going to die. He's plunged to his death. <clears throat> Are there any uh, questions on that? on this first chapter. I think in reading this, it's, it, there's a lot of things that come out. But there's a lot of things here that we still have to cover, but very interesting chapter. No, I don't see there's anything here in our chapters, in these chapters that indicate that. Uh, I'm sure that the sailors, when they got back to land, probably told other people, their families, about their experiences, but whether or not they ever continued to pray and ask for, you know, in this case, repentance, new repentance for God, to God, I don't know. I don't think they did. They probably just had a whole bunch of gods and they just added uh, Jonah's God to their list of gods because they probably had a lot of them back in those days. <clears throat> right. He saved him. Jonah was saved by God. Even though he had disobeyed God, he was saved. He was shown mercy. This is a whole a very, very important point. Yes, he had a plan for, for Jonah. And of course we all realize here again that Jonah jeopardized innocent sailors. And his own, right. Yeah.
That's a good point. Thank you. Well, we know one thing. God had a cop- captive audience. <coughs> Let's go on to chapter 2 here, because this talks about here, the, it's, we call it a psalm or a prayer. It's a very good one. I don't know whether or not this was all done at the same time that he wrote this book, but it is an excellent prayer from the standpoint of what it teaches us. And of course now we realize that Jonah is getting acquainted, more acquainted, with God. <clears throat> then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, it's like, you know, praying from hell here in this case. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. He's confessing here, I think. No question. This is part of the repentance. And he answered me. Another very important thing here. He answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your bills and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me even to my soul. The, wa- the deep closed around me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God. <coughs> When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you and your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of the thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. What we say about this, there are some, some interesting points here too. Jonah's prayer and deliverance is, is very important here because it is ironic, in this case, Jonah spoke of God as driving Jonah, Jonah from his presence. And actually, as we understand it, that was Jonah's own fault. His aim, in this case, was to flee God by going to where? Tarshish, getting that ship getting on a ship and going to Tarsus. But reading 2.5 here, I should say, a nine. The sailors who responded to the Lord's power to save and acts of mercy with sacrifices and vows of their own. And that's a very interesting point here.
Thank you. Yeah, you got to be very careful what you say. That's what God wants us to remember. Right. And he does not have the right to make this judgment. All right. We can't make a judgment as to who should receive God's mercy. That is absolutely taboo. Not to be... This is a prayer that basically I think all of us should have in our hearts, especially when we have we face difficulties, because it tells us a lot of things here. Cry out, cry to God, ask for His help. And in this case, when Jonah did this, he was saved, he was delivered. Are we? Good point. Thank you. Well, one thing that uh, Jonah says here, which we can look at just briefly, he's praying to God, which in this case he says is in where? The holy sanctuary in heaven. But for all practical purposes, God is everywhere, not just in the holy sanctuary in heaven. I think that's really important. This whole prayer, I think, Ex uh, exemplifies the fact that Jonah now is becoming more acquainted. His relationship with his God has definitely taken a good turn. And he's starting to realize the error of his ways. And of course he also understands that he has been saved by God's grace. He has been given mercy. And this whole thing about this is that it should also be given to 
as we understand it, to the Medes, to the, excuse me, to the, to the Ninevites. The next part of this is the Jonah's obedience, anger, and his ad admonishment. And this is an outline here, real briefly. So we'll be reading chapter three and four. In chapter three through four, God reasserts his commission. He calls him, he says, I'm sending you. This time a chastened Jonah obeys. He should have done this earlier. Much would have been much easier for him. And he goes. Nineveh represents <coughs> repents, excuse me, repents in mass after hearing God's message as he was preached by Jonah. And God does what? He refrains. <clears throat> from the judgment that Jonah had warned was coming, which was what? That the Lord was going to destroy, or Nineveh was going to be destroyed in how many days? Forty days? Jonah, unable to accept God's mercy toward Israel's enemies, moves from anger to despair. And we read that in chapter 4. And again, here's a situation where God again deploys nature to chasten Jonah. And this time, how does he do it? Through the rapid growth and demise, death of a plant. I guess it was a, a vine or a plant that provided the prophet some shade. And of course now the chapter ends rather abruptly in that last chapter, chapter 11, and, and, uh, verse 11. The book ends abruptly leaving Jonah and the reader pondering God's final question. Shouldn't God and his people feel sorry for such a great city and desire sinners to receive mercy rather than his wrath. That's the question we all have to ask ourselves as well. On three, three, verses three, chapter three, um, verse three, it says a city so large that it took three days to see it all. The city circumference was roughly three miles, as we understand it. So it would not have been; it would not have taken three days to walk around it. Uh, this description in the Bible here possibly indicates that. This, this is probably how long it took for Jonah to spread his message in the city. And of course, we have to also remember that there are lots of little villages and other surrounding structures and communities around the city of Nineveh, which was a fortified city. God desired to save rather than destroy such a vast city with its 120,000 residents and large numbers of animals. We read that in 411. Jonah knew, however, of God's desire for people to repent rather than be destroyed. Looking at chapter three and verses five through six, it says, so the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaiming a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh 
And he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covering himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. One thing you can say about this is that this is the second time in this little book that a pagan or pagans responded favorably to the Lord. We saw this in chapter 1 with the sailors. But this is now the people of Nineveh and the king. One thing I can say here about this is that in ancient Israel, fasting would often accompany prayer and repentance as part of the ceremony. Especially in times of what? Distress. And wearing sackcloth, and I'll explain what that is, and sitting on a heap of ashes would often accompany mourning and sorrowful repentance. And the Assyrians, which are a, a Semitic tribe, a Semitic people, probably had a similar customs because, you know, these people lived in the same area. So they may have picked up some of these things. Who knows who adopted what? These activities, which are important here, allow the participants to express their grief in a very tangible way for all, including God, to see. Now what is sackcloth? I look this up in the dictionary and they say, say sackcloth is the following. It is a cloth made of black goat's hair it is very coarse, it is very rough, and it is very thick. And it was used for sacks. And also, of course, it was used for by mourners as a repentance, as a sign of repentance. And we see that in Matthew 11, uh, verse 21. And it was put upon animals by the people of Nineveh. In verses 3, chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, it reads, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble saying, and this is the interesting point here, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. They were covered, the animals were covered as well, and cry mightily to God. Yea, let every man or every one turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hand. By extending the fast and the morning rituals to animals, this is an interesting point here, the king communicated that this dire emergency required all normal operations, activities, to cease so that everyone, I mean, I'm underlining this, everyone might pray earnestly. So God will notice and repent of their evil ways. And of course, we all know that one of their evil ways, the most terrible on, their li on the list, was their violence, which they had been uh, known to commit to others uh, in their area. I don't know exactly how animals would mourn, but if I'm not eating or drinking, I guess that would be one thing that I would be concerned about if I were an animal, and I would probably be going, you know, where's my food, where's my drink? So maybe that's how it is. Yes?
reading on, <coughs> it says in verse 9, and this is the king of Nineveh speaking. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? The king had his doubts, and he had good reason to because of his wicked ways and, of course, the wickedness, the tyranny of his people and his regime. And then, of course, the one that's important here at the very end, verse 10, it says, Then God saw their works. In other words, he saw their repentance, the act of their, their repentance in their mourning, wearing the sackcloth, sitting in ashes, and praying for, for, for forgiveness. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. In other words, God changed his mind. But God always has his option. He can bring wrath, or he can bring what? He can bring mercy. He could have destroyed them, but he did not. He was ready to save them. He was ready to meet them <coughs> with Meet the repentance with mercy. And we'll see that in the next chapter, chapter 4, verses 2 and 11. This chapter, in terms of a summary here, uh, takes into account, in fact, it takes an unexpected turn here in this chapter. Jonah himself as we all remember, is a recipient of God's mercy, his salvation. He was saved by God. Complains about the mercy that the Lord has dispensed to the Assyrians by saving them. And this, of course, he says to God himself, he's angry, very upset. In fact, I think his response is really very insolent. I would say he was basically dissing, all right, God. But this, of course, God's response is rather remarkable, too. Because he didn't just go push him down. But he kind of like scolded him like a little kid. There was an admonishment here that he's expressed from the standpoint of being rather even keel, and it was given in com with compassion. I never thought of that before. God could have been very angry and spoken all kinds of things here. That would have been something that we would read in the Bible that we would say, wow. Well, he really got his ass chewed. But he, in this case here, that didn't happen. <coughs> in 4.2, Jonah practically quotes Exodus 34, six, uh, verses 6 through 7, which is a passage that's set in the context of Israel's covenant relationship with the Lord. And it basically talks about salvation. And even in the Old Testament, as we all read now, God was concerned to spread salvation, the word, to all nations. That was a covenant relationship which God wanted with Israel. And unfortunately, that didn't happen. In verses 3, 5, and I'll go ahead and read that now. <clears throat> but he distressed Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. Now he explains himself, his motives, the reasons why he fled. <clears throat> it would have been helpful to have read this before we got started, but this is exactly what Jonah says to God. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Rather, 
unusual statement. God saved him before. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? I mean, this kind of puts you in a spot. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the, of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would come of the city. Jonah's desire to die rather than embrace God's will and his willingness to wait in hope that the city would be destroyed are signs of what? Of his hard-heartedness, his hard heart. And of course his hatred of for the Assyrians. This is not showing love, God's love. This is showing something that's totally opposite, showing his hatred of the Assyrians. And of course this is something that would be condemned later by Jesus himself, who pointed out that <clears throat> the Assyrians, these Assyrians of this generation, would be there in the final day of judgment against people who were just hard-hearted. And he mentions that in, I believe, what chapter was that? Um, my, my lesson here. I think that's in Matthew. Where Jesus talks about, yeah, 528, that Jonah did a very good job. Did a very good job of preaching. And the Lord God prepared a plant, a vine here, and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he was death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Jonah had nothing to do with this plant. It was God who did this. And he did this to show love to Jonah. And of course, if you look at Israel as a case, he did this also for Israel and to show those in Israel who had the same attitude. <clears throat> 411, and should I not pity Nineveh? Excuse me, I read uh, 10 here. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plan for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between the right hand and their left and much livestock? I guess you can make, the point here is that people in Nineveh were living in spiritual darkness. And God gave, graciously gave, or sent the light of his prophetic word into a wicked city. Of course, we all realize that not all who encounter God's light respond favorably. But God is eager to save those who receive his word in genuine repentance and faith. 
And they certainly did that here in the case of Nineveh. The question, the answer to that question, I think you can see is, God would rather save than destroy. Those who have received his mercy must be glad for that same mercy to be shown to others, even to their enemies. And that's the point that we all have to follow. We do not judge. Right? If we have mercy, we receive mercy, we need to let that flow on to others. And even to people who we don't necessarily like, we consider them our enemies or our adversaries or our foes, right? People that don't agree with us, we cannot be an obstacle. We must reach out, we must help, we must try to save them too. We were given that by God. We need to make sure that it falls through to others. Matt, Matthew, okay. We're in the same. <clears throat> what are some of the meanings and the messages? I'm going to do a little summary. The lesson Jonah learned was one that the entire nation Israel needed. And of course, it's a lesson for us as well. We're all part of this. My salvation comes from the Lord alone. And he stated that in chapter 2, verse 9. The other thing that's important is salvation is the Lord's to give to whomever he pleases. And those who have received God's mercy must not resist the flow of mercy to others, even their enemies. Key point. There is no domain, not even the depths of the ocean or a wicked city, where God cannot deliver and protect human life. He certainly showed that. The sailors were saved after God calmed the storm. Jonah was saved from drowning when God set the fish to swallow him. And of course, there is no person or nation that God cannot judge or saved from judgment. God was eager to bring salvation beyond the borders of Israel, which was his desire. And from the beginning, God's desire was to bless the nation through the nation, through Israel, part of the covenant relationship that he desired. And God's heart for the nations is that they turn from idols which he also hoped in the case of Israel, to know him, the God of heaven, who created the world. And this, I guess, uh, is the, uh, one of the things that is true wisdom, and of course, is that we submit ourselves wholly to the will of God. And we do not turn our back on him and deny his call. We, we do as he asks. On the two-way street, I was asked answer a couple or state a few things here. I guess I have a few more minutes. God pursued a reluctant prophet because he knew that Jonah needed the missionary trip to Nineveh as much as the Ninevites needed to hear his message. God called Nineveh, uh, Jonah to go to Nineveh because God loved the Ninevites. Some people I know find that hard to believe and wanted them in his kingdom. But God also <coughs> called Jonah because God loved Jonah. Because he wanted Jonah to grow and become more like him as they worked together. God wanted Jonah to find the true rest 
that comes only by being in a saving relationship. And this is important, with him and when doing God's will, which he didn't want to do at first, which includes reaching out to others. In this case, Jonah is going to be giving a message to the Ninevites. God pursued Jonah, as we see, would not let him go and held on to him until Jonah recognized God's mighty hand. And on that, I guess I can conclude. I hope that this was satisfactory, that you understood the lesson, and it is helpful to you. So, please, would you give the final message, the final prayer? Mm -hmm. Loving Father, thank you so much for your grace. And even though sometimes we may be reluctant like Jonah, or we may be self-righteous like Jonah, that you even have mercy for us. And Father, thank you that you do want all to come to repentance. We pray that you will work in our lives and help us to be faithful <coughs> servants of you, following wherever you lead. Be with us through the rest of the Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.
Good morning and welcome to the Dillingham Seventh-day Adventist Church. Welcome to everyone here on this beautiful, sunny, and a little chilly day. And to everyone who might be listening on the radio or on the phone. I'd like to begin our song service with the song Shirley was just playing, Faith of Our Fathers, number 304 in the hymnal, 304. We are living in interesting times. And I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And as we see the events around us and the things around us, we can look back at the history of the way that God has led us in the past and know that the faith of our fathers, ultimately the faith that God gave us in his word, is the faith that will carry us through. Faith of our fathers. 304. Faith of our fathers living still In spite of dungeon, fire, and sword Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy Whene'er we hear that glorious word Faith of our fathers, holy faith we will be true to thee till death. Our fathers chained in prisons dark were still in heart and conscience free. How sweet would be their children's fate if they like them could die for thee. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Faith of our fathers, we will love both friend and foe in all our strife, and preach thee to as love knows how. By kindly words and virtuous life, faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. 
Next, let's turn to number 509, How Firm a Foundation. And 509. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, he is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus has fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with thee thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, oh never, no, never forsake. Thank God for his mercy and his power in our lives. Let's turn to number 249. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, 249. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children, in His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, love with those and his ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song.
morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you, Warren, for leading out in song service. Wonderful songs to sing this morning. Um, just a couple of announcements. Um, I guess first off, I've never done a reading before, um, but we have in here the first reading for member transfership for Pastor Todd and Gina from the Ridge SDA Church in Clinton, Mississippi to our church here. And I know that um, we've been blessed having Pastor Todd and Miss Gina here as well. So this is the first reading. And I guess next Sabbath we'll have the second reading. Um, just some things to point out uh, tomorrow. We are scheduled to have a school board meeting at 5 p.m. Um, that is a postponement of the previous week. We were supposed to have a school board meeting, but we weren't able to. We have nominating committee coming up um, October 3rd. And also, um, we have evangelistic meetings coming up next month as well. And unless there are some other announcements that I am not aware of, we will go ahead and have our opening hymn, hymn number one, Praise to the Lord. Please stand as we sing number one. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise Him, He is thy health and salvation. O oh, ye who hear, now to His temple draw near, join ye in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Shieldeth thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires all have been? Granted in what he ordaineth. Praise to the Lord, who doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do, if with his love he befriend thee. You may be seated. Sorry about that. Happy Sabbath. Uh, today's offering is a uh, local budget, and we'll pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Sabbath day. Please bless the offering, multiply it, and help us to pay our bills, Father. Bless our children, Lord, and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, happy Sabbath. The story for this morning is Invisible in Kenya. It also has a text from the Bible, it's a promise. In Psalms 91, seven, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. It's a beautiful promise. The whole Psalm 91 is a beautiful promise. And the story this morning is about an invisible, invisible in Kenya. One early morning, Thank you. Okay. One early morning, the sunlight, the reflection of the light in the morning was coming through the door. And as the light was getting lighter outside, <clears throat> Janet, she was still in bed. And she her loud noise outside, people crying. And she jumped out of the bed really fast and went and opened the door. And what she saw was the little town covered in flames, big flames, people screaming crying, children crying, and she was so afraid because these bad people, um, we call them guerrilleros, um, they, were, they came to the little town and they were burning every house in there, the little cabin house. And as they did that, starting one by one, they also got into the house and got whatever they could before they put fire in the house. And you hear the children, the people screaming. And as, as they were screaming so loud, they were killing the people. So when they finished with one house, they went to the next, and the next, and the next. And as Janice saw all this, she only saw this flame so high, the dark smoke, it was just covering all the little homes. So she was so afraid that she just stood in and she could not even hardly breathe. She was so frightening. And then she couldn't do anything. She thought as she was standing, she leaned back to her door, the cabin of the family. And she says, I don't have no place to hide here. And the only thing came to her mind at that moment of frightening, it was to pray. And she closed her eyes and she said, God, please help me. No one only could you can save me. Please make him invisible from this man that come in. And when she opened her eyes, what she saw was this man coming 
They are, had already put fire in her neighbor's house, and they were walking toward her house. And she was stood up so still, it's almost like she could not move. And as they came closer and closer to her house, all of a sudden she can feel them standing with their feet right in front of her face, right in front of her. And they did whatever there in the floor with their feet. And she was, she stand so still. And then, all of a sudden, she could see them walking away from her house. And as they all walk away through the jungle to the tall grass, she took a deep breath and she looked and her house was the only house standing and she was alive. And she thanked God for making her invisible. How the angels made her house invisible to these men and her. And what a beautiful lesson for each of us. She, Janet, is the only one standing, still alive, member of the church. And she's the oldest person in that community in Kenya. And we can, we can ask a question herself, ourselves. How I am praying to God. Many times we pray for things that God don't answer those prayers. God doesn't honor prayers that doesn't come from deep in our hearts. And it's a, it's a good story for us as a Christian. When we are faithful to God, we can call on God. It doesn't matter what situation we are, in danger or whatever. God always has his holy angels that protect us always. And let's remember that. Let's have a little prayer. Dear Jesus, we are so grateful, Lord, for this Sabbath day. We are so grateful, Father, to be here worshiping your name. And Lord, as we go to the second part of the sermon, that you open our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we can learn more and more about you. Help us, Lord, as Janet, to have faith, pray, and how you answer her prayer. Lord, we want to be like that. Help us and guide us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. It's time for our praise and prayer. And John Monteith asked me to fill in for him. I'm thankful for our evangelistic meetings over in Togiak and Pastor and Gina and the work over there. And I want to also pray for them that God will do an amazing work in their place as well as here when we have the meetings here coming up. Does anyone have any praises you would like to share or a prayer request you would like to share with the group? Yes.
Amen. 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 I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the place where they're taking the oil out, but it, they're making progress. I haven't seen it yesterday, but I saw it the day before. But uh, I understand that the oil didn't go as far as they expected. So praise... Praise the Lord. Amen. We're thankful for that. Anyone else have a praise or a prayer request? Yes. Yes. prayer for those yes for those who are sick pastor dan's wife um the people in manakota against the wasley family yes yes our children definitely i always appreciate that promise where god says he will save our children he will just deliver them from the hand from the enemy. Praise. Amen. Thank God for his healing power. Yes. Some of those people may not even know they're being used by God, but like, like Cyrus, God is still using them. Anyone else have a praise or a prayer request? I'd like to also add, uh, ask for prayers for the situation in Afghanistan. It's come to our attention that there's an effort to um, evacuate about I think about 700 individuals who are at risk, um, some of them because they're Christians, some of them because they are aid workers or um, others that have tried to help out the American uh, forces as interpreters or whatever and didn't get evacuated. Um, there's some prejudice among Af uh, against Afghanis among Americans sadly, and also elsewhere in the world as well, that makes it difficult for them to find uh, places to resettle them. So I'd like to pray that, uh, have us pray that um, God will touch the right people and make the doors open, uh, but also prayers for the Christians that remain in Afghanistan. We this week saw uh, there's a, a um, organization called Voice of the Martyrs, you may, may or may not have heard of that tracks the situations of Christians that are in difficult places in the world. And they, these are Christians that have remained in Afghanistan, chosen not to flee, knowing that they're going to be at risk because they feel that God has 
kept them there for a reason so that they can share the gospel though under difficult circumstances so I want to pray for them as well and I'd also like to pray and praise uh, we just learned this week that uh, there are three young men um, from Oklahoma Academy planning to come to Dillingham I think um, I don't know if all three of them will come to Dillingham or two of them or what but that next year when they graduate June or whatever somewhere around there they may be coming as um, student missionaries similar to when we had Daniel here so keep that in prayer they would be working here but also in surrounding villages as far as possible let us kneel Loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for your mercy to us as we learned in the story of Jonah and that you also love everyone else in the world, sometimes people that we consider our enemies. Father, we pray for the difficult situation in Afghanistan and for those that are remaining there as Christians, sharing their faith, as well as those that are trying to be evacuated to safety. I pray that you will work in each situation according to your will. Father, we pray for those struggling with grief, loss for the Wassily family, for those that lost their loved one to COVID in Manakotic, and for all of the others dealing with cancer and other diseases, other illnesses. We also pray for Dan, Pastor Dan's wife. We were blessed by his time here. We pray that she will be healed so that he can continue the revival ministry that in the other places that he had planned to go. According to your will, we ask this. Father, we pray for the mission work here in the Dillingham and surrounding villages region. For the young people that are planning to come next year, if it be your will, we ask that you will open the doors and make everything possible for the gospel work to go forward. We pray for Pastor Todd and Gina as they share the gospel and the members in Togiak as well that are working with him. We pray that hearts will be opened and lives will be touched. We also pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out there and here in Dillingham as we go forward trusting that you have have asked us to share the gospel here and wherever we are so we pray that you will do that father we pray for the message that vince will be bringing to us today that your spirit will touch our hearts and open our ears in jesus name we ask these things amen <laughs> I don't know if anyone has a planned special music today, but I have a special music I'd like to sing. It starts, it's, I'd like all of you to join. It starts with, happy birthday, for Verity here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Verity. Happy birthday to you, and many more. Our scripture this morning is from the second book of Hebrews, 1 through 4. It says, therefore, now Vince is going to tell us what the therefore was about, but we must give 
more time and heed the warnings of the things we've heard that, that we don't drift away. For if the word spoken through angels provided steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received the just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and were confirmed to us through those who heard him. God also hearing, having, bearing witness both with signs and wonders, which various meanings and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Thank you, Jim. Let's um, bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you again for another Sabbath day. I thank you that we are one Sabbath closer to your soon return. And Lord, as you have allowed me to take this position here today. I freely admit here before my brothers and sisters that I have nothing and am nothing outside of you. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us all right now as you would have us to hear a message from you this morning. I pray that your will would be done and that your purpose would be accomplished here this morning, and that we would leave from this place um, forever changed because of your working in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to invite you all this morning to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13, and we'll start with verse number 1. 1 Kings chapter 13, starting with verse number 1, we read, and behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. 
And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and it became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said to the king, If you will give me half your house, I will not go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken to the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said to them, Which way did he go? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said to his sons, Saddle me the donkey. So they saddled him the donkey, and he rode thereon. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, Are you the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And he said unto him, Well, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spoke unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord. For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back, and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to you, Eat no bread, and drink no water, your carcass shall not come unto the tomb of your fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the donkey, to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way, and killed him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by, and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass, and they came, and they told it in the city where the old prophet lived. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It's the man of God, who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. And he spake to his son, saying, Saddle me the donkey. And they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast in the way, and the donkey and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor had torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the carcass of the man of God and laid it upon the donkey and brought it back. And the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. And he laid his carcass in his own grave, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. And it came to pass, after he had buried him, that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb wherein the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying which he cried by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel, and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. After this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, 
but made again of the lowest of the people, priests of the high places, whosoever he would, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. This chapter in the Bible, I will have to admit, caused a lot of reaction, emotion in me, especially when I was younger, because I thought that this was highly unfair, that the man of God gets deceived and then gets killed, but the one who lied to him, it seems like nothing happens to him, right? Now, the purpose of this talk today isn't to go over the ins and the outs and the justifications of why God did what he did, because the Bible tells us that the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God is fair, and he has given us enough evidence in his word to establish that. And when we get to heaven, then I can ask him the ins and outs, and he can fill in the blanks in this story. But as I got older, my mindset with this story started to shift. And instead of focusing on, man, that seems really unfair, I started to think, wow, how merciful is God? Because I can recall numerous times that the Lord has convicted me in my heart that I needed to do something and I said, okay, Lord, and then somehow, some way, I turned from that. And yet, here I still stand today. The Lord certainly has not dealt with us according to our sins. What I would like to point out, to, what I would like to point out in this story today, first off, I want to take a closer look at King Jeroboam. Now, Jeroboam, for those of you who know of him in the Bible, was a servant of King Solomon. And because of the choices that Solomon had made in his life in turning from the things that the Lord had told him to do, God sent a prophet to tell Jeroboam that he was going to receive ten of the 12 tribes of Israel and be ruler over them because God was not going to completely cut off David because of God's mercy towards David Solomon's or I shouldn't say Solomon Solomon's son Rehoboam was allowed to rule over two tribes Judah and Benjamin and so I'd like for you to turn back one chapter 1 Kings chapter 12 And I want you to look at the reaction after all this happens. The word of the Lord comes to pass, which he spoke to Jeroboam. Which, by the way, once Solomon found out about this, Solomon wanted to kill Jeroboam. But the Lord protected him, sending him into Egypt until Solomon died. But now Jeroboam has come back. And Solomon's son has made the unfortunate mistake of not listening to the counsel given to him by the older people who served under Solomon, but he decided to listen to his friends. So in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25, this is after the people have left from serving Solomon's son, and now they have put Jeroboam as the king over them says in verse 25 then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and lived therein and went out from thence and built Penuel and Jeroboam said in his heart mm, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem 
Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, Solomon's son. And then they're going to kill me, and then they're going to go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. So behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, which means the house of God, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan, and he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made, and he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So here we see it was a lack of faith that led Jeroboam to turn towards idolatry. The Lord had told him by the word of his prophet that he was going to give him 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. And that came to pass. Even though Solomon had tried to have him killed, the Lord preserved his life. And he was made king. And once the word of the Lord came to pass, doubt started to creep in. And that led Jeroboam to make a terrible mistake. As we can see, Jeroboam not only set up idols, he also set up a feast that was likened to the feast that is in Judah. So he set up an alternate form of worship alternate methods of worship he also set up how should I put this he devised his own days to have special worship all of this to lead the people of God away from the true form of worship into idolatry because of a lack of faith now, the amazing thing about this is that God did not immediately have Jeroboam destroyed. God does not deal with us according to our sins. He sends somebody from the tribe of Judah all the way to come and talk to him because of the fact that God seeks to save and not to destroy in Ezekiel 33, we read that God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're told that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so in mercy, God sends someone, we're not told who, someone from the tribe of Judah to speak to Jeroboam. And Jeroboam's response to this initially is to stretch out his hand to have that man of God destroyed, lay hold on him. Now in the Bible, someone stretching out their hand, if you think of how when God talks about delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt, talks about how he delivered them with stretched out hand, stretched out arm. Right? It's a symbol of power. So God sends his prophet to go and talk to Jeroboam 
someone who has fallen away from the worship of the true God and set up their own forms of worship, their hand is stretched out against that man of God and immediately his hand withers. Right? So if the hand, stretched out hand is a symbol of power, but that hand ends up being withered by the word of the Lord, what does that say to you? Powerless, right? Jeroboam realizes this and asks the man of God, pray to the Lord your God that he will restore my hand to me again. And God in his mercy answers the prayer of the man of God. Because God is seeking to save and not to destroy. I also would like to point out the boldness of the man of God because that is essential. He didn't come to Jeroboam and say, uh, excuse me, king, um, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing that. The Lord wants you to, you know, worship him and, you know, you should probably not burn this incense and do these things on the altar. The Bible says he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. He got Jeroboam's attention. So much to the point so that Jeroboam was like, look, somebody go and shut that man up. I can't take it anymore. Shut him up. Somebody make him be quiet. This boldness is essential because when someone speaks to you in a way that is, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say timid or hesitantly, does not have the same effect as when someone speaks to you with boldness. For example, as a child, I was very um, stubborn, still can be, the Lord's working on me, amen. That amen was too loud. <laughs> and my mom often had to deal with teachers reporting about my stubborn behavior in the classroom. And many times the teachers in dealing with me would have a certain tone in trying to discipline me that I didn't really respond to. But my mom, on the other hand, she might even say the exact same thing that the teacher said to me. But there was a certain boldness when my mom would speak to me to tell me that I needed to do something that I responded to because I knew that my mom meant what she said and if I did not respond positively to what she was saying to me there were going to be certain consequences that I did not want to have to deal with and when the Holy Spirit is leading us to speak to people sometimes regarding the things that they are doing, not because God is looking to destroy them or condemn them, but because God is looking to save them, we have to give the message a certain sound so that people understand that God, not me, that God means what he says and that if there is not a response to that, that results, in a that results in a turning away from those things, there are going to be consequences that not only they don't want to deal with, but God does not want to have to inflict on someone. As I've said before, God refers to the consequences that he is going to have to lay out at the time of the end as a strange act. God does not want to have to do this. The consequences were originally for Satan and his angels, right? Not 
that was not designed for any of us. Another thing I would like to point out in this story as we get to the man of God. The man of God and in verse 11, the old prophet who lied to him and told him that an angel spoke to him by the word of the Lord and what that angel told him was different than what the Lord had told him. And prophets and kings were told that the old prophet didn't just say this one time to him. And the man of God was like, okay, I'll go with you. He repeated, to, he repeated it to him over and over again and urged him, come on, come with me to my house. The angel told me, I promise you, that's what he told me. You're supposed to come with me to my house and eat bread. Repeated this lie and urged him to return with him to his house. I would invite all of you to turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And we will start at verse 6. Galatians chapter 1, starting with verse 6, we read, this is Paul writing. I marvel, speaking to the Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Pay attention to what Paul says here in these next two verses. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. God not only gave evidence to Jeroboam that he had a message for him when he reached out his hand and his hand withered and his altar was torn and ashes started pouring out, but that was also evidence to the man of God that God did send you to do what he said he wanted you to do. But now you have an old prophet, which I find interesting that when it talks about the man who spoke to Jeroboam, it calls him the man of God, but... The other one, it refers to him just as an old prophet. Sometimes it just calls him a prophet, the prophet. But just because you're a prophet doesn't mean that you are a prophet of God. It doesn't mean that you're a true prophet. It just means that you're a prophet. Clearly, judging from the actions of this man, he was not a true prophet, but rather a false one which is why there's a distinction between the man of God and the old prophet. But God had given the man of God evidence that this is what he wanted him to do. Therefore, the word of the Lord that came to him that said that he was not to eat bread nor drink water nor go back by the same place that he came, but was to continue on some other way to head back to Judah, also came from the Lord. And the fact that he listened to the old prophet who told him, hey, well, an angel told me that that's not what you're supposed to do. You're actually supposed to come back with me to my house. 
meant that he shouldn't have listened to him at all. If you look at 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 1, Peter warns, speaking of the Old Testament, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. You see, given the fact that the old prophet's sons came back and told him all the stuff that the man of God did and all the stuff that he said, and the old prophet was like, which way did he go? I want to talk to him. He clearly wanted to be associated with the man of God, but not in a way that was acceptable to God. What I mean by that is when Peter talks about by covetousness, he wanted what the man of God had. That ability to be able to do the things that he did similar to what Simon in the book of Acts wanted when he saw Peter and John and Philip come to Samaria and they're preaching the word of God and they're healing people and doing all these things and he said hey I'll give you money if you teach me how to lay hands on people and give them the Holy Spirit this same mindset led him to lie to the man of God and to deceive him to the point to where it cost him his life and even then he said when I'm dead bury me next to him because his words are going to come to pass bury me next to him because we're God in his mercy could not allow the man of God to not be punished in this situation. And I hesitate in saying that because there's still a part of me, my heart, I feel really bad for him. And I'm still, a part of me is like, that's not fair. <laughs> but God could not allow this to stand. Because had he allowed this to stand, Jeroboam would have been able to say, well, he disobeyed, and you let him skate. So I'm going to keep worshiping these idols and doing the things that I'm doing over here, and you'll overlook this too because you did that for him. So why shouldn't you do that for me? The penalty that the man of God received, actually, when you think about it, is further evidence that the man of God was speaking truth when he told Jeroboam the evils of what he was doing. I used to think that it was, man, God, that's going to look bad because here you are, you send this prophet, and now everybody's finding out that he's, he's dead. He didn't even make it back to his hometown. How is that going to look? I would think that that would be like, well, psh, but it's not. And God, in his infinite wisdom, and me, in my wisdom, knew that, which is why he made the decision that he did. One of the reasons why. But the point that I really want to hone in on today is... the far-reaching consequences of the decisions that we make and how that is relevant to us today. Jeroboam, for example, made the decision 
to set up alternate forms of worship, alternate days of worship, alternate places of worship. And that ended up leading the entire nation of Israel to ruin, to the point to where God removed them from their land and they were no longer distinguishable as God's chosen people. Not only did that result in total ruin for Israel, but it also led the kings that came after Jeroboam to be a little bit more bolder in their disobedience to God and a little bit more bolder as we read King so-and-so followed in all the sins of Jeroboam and did more evil than anyone who came before him and that he blah 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 and on down the list. God was still merciful and sending prophets just like he sent the man of God even though we read how this situation turned out for him. However, by God showing his mercy and continuing to send prophets to the people who were being led astray, who knows how many people were saved because of those prophets who decided that they were going to do what God had asked them to do and not swerve to the right or to the left. When we get to heaven, maybe we'll see the far-reaching consequences of their decisions. But that leads me to think about the situation that we find ourselves in today. And how the decisions of those who are in authority across our world today are leading us down the path to where we are going to find ourselves in a time of trouble such as never been seen before in the history of this earth. far-reaching consequences. But, praise God, we are told that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And as we see an increase in trouble, God will respond by giving his people an increase in boldness. Boldness to preach the word of God and to not be hesitant and to be timid when we are called to preach the gospel of Christ to a world that is desperately in need of it. Because more and more people are looking around at the things that are happening and they are starting to form questions in their mind. What in the world is going on? Why are these things happening? Why does it look like more and more of our freedoms are being restricted? Why does it look like more and more that the beast in Revelation 13 with the lamb-like horns is speaking more and more like a dragon? And when people have those questions, God would love to be able to use each and every one of us to address those questions, to give them an answer in due season, to lead them to the word of God, which has been faithfully preserved for us, that we might be able to lead them to Jesus, who alone can save them from what is to come. I don't know what God has in store for each of you, or even for myself, really. But the Bible tells us that some of us will lose our lives for the gospel. Some of us will be exiled from our homes. Some of us will be called to stand before kings and rulers to give a testimony and to give them the last message of warning that they might ever receive. And right now, while we have the time, we should be praying, asking God 
for holy boldness that we might speak his word with the power of the Holy Spirit that would get them to turn from their ways before it is too late. Jeroboam, unfortunately, did not return from his evil way. But I believe by the grace of God that there will be many, maybe because of some of your testimonies, who will hear the word of God speaking to them and will turn from their evil way. And maybe because of that decision, will have far-reaching consequences that will save other people who will look and say, hey, you know what? If that ruler has realized that this is the truth, then maybe there's something to that. My prayer for us today is that God would continue to strengthen our faith. That we would continue to remember that although the power of this earth may stretch out its hand towards us, God will take care of us through every day or all the way. And <laughs> Jesus promised us that he would never leave us that he would never forsake us. And because of that, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What shall I fear what man will do to me? I invite all of you to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 99. Warren, as Warren comes up, we'll sing, God will take care of you. Please stand as we sing. Don't be afraid, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through days of toil when your heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fears your path assail, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. You may need, He will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon his breast, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your promise to be with us 
no matter what may be the test. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to be with us, continue to help us, continue to lead us and guide us, that we may do what you would have for us to do, Lord. Because we know that in following your will, <coughs> excuse me, in following your will, Lord, we don't know the far-reaching consequences. We have no idea who might be saved because of our adherence to the leading of your Holy Spirit, no matter how small or insignificant we think the instruction might be. And Lord, we know that these little moments, these little trials, these little tribulations that we go through in which we exercise the faith which you have given us and we see what you by your outstretched arm can do not only for us but for others in our lives is preparing us for that great test Lord where we will have to stand for you on our own by the power of your Holy Spirit. No earthly support, but Lord, as long as we have you, we have all the support we need. Thank you, Lord. So, <clears throat> thank you, Lord, so much for taking care of us. Please continue to bless us throughout the rest of this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen.